and good day to you. We are really happy that you decide um, to join us again today as we continue with another episode of Pastor's Corner. And today we'll be dealing with um, the Seventh-day Adventist and its identity, part two. I know many of you enjoyed it last week and um, you were requesting a part two because you thought that the things that were discussed, uh, enough time wasn't given to complete the, the discussion. So today we'll be engaged in a part two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its identity. At this point in time, we'll pray and after that I'll introduce you to uh, my panelists. Let us pray. Oh God and our Father, we give you thanks and praise for your love. We thank you, God, for your mercy. We thank you, dear God, for your Holy Spirit. I pray in a very special way, dear God, as we spend time with you today. I pray, O oh Father, that you will enlighten our minds, our understanding. Even the viewers, I pray as they listen that they will be enlightened and they will be closer drawn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I got two competent um, gentlemen with me today. And to my extreme right, he will introduce himself. He'll tell you his name, um, what, what, what work he does with the conference, and a little about himself. So to my extreme right, we have a young man down there. Good morning to everyone online. Um, we are here again as pastors of this wonderful conference. My name is um, Kimi um, Palmer. Um, um, with the Seoul Central District, to be exact, the Windsor Forest SDA Church, as my pastor in church. Um, with the conference, um, um, the auditor of the conference overseeing the, overseeing the churches in terms of auditing of the churches, schools, and other um, institutions of this conference. So may God bless your heart as we dialogue, as we share from the word of God this morning. All right, and then to my immediate right, I got another young man there. A pleasant good morning. I'm Charles Gittens. Uh, I am pastoring in the Northeastern District. Uh, those churches would be uh, Snell Hall, La Poetry, St. John's, and Hermitage. Uh, I'm married for a long, long time, and I'm a pastor for more than a generation now. So I'm happy to be on the program uh, this morning. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so today we'll get straight into a continuation from last week's program, um, the SD and its identity. I just want to take that opportunity to welcome everyone who decided to join. Don't forget to like and to share the page so somebody can um, benefit from what would happen here um, today. And um, for those of you who may not know, I'm Lambert Paul, I'm pastor of the Western One District, pastor of Florida, Clojure, Mongranby, and uh, Florida. All right, so our first question today is as Seventh-day Adventists, we pride ourselves on the distinctiveness of our doctrines. Can you please share our uniqueness in the following areas using biblical support for each instance, dress and food? So I just want to hear some, get some insight on these two areas. Thank you. Well, to begin looking at the question of, of dress, the dress and food, the question, just to go back for us, speaks in terms of being distinct and unique in areas of, well, two, mainly dress um, and food. I want to go to the Word of God as we use as our foundation, as we look at being unique in line of dress. Um, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, um, the text Read for us in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest, um, modest apparel, right? Um, with shamefacedness, with sobriety, and go on to say, My people, brother, here gold, pearls are costly array. But become it what? Um, um, but but, but become it with good, with good works. That text speaks a lot about dress. Um, you'll hear others, but I'm just pulling that one for you about dress and how we are unique in that area. When we look at a dress, it speaks a lot about something that, uh, that I consider simple, modest, moral, and appropriate. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are unique in that area, how we adorn our, ourselves. Um, yes, you can make reference to, to other religion and how they might they might dress themselves. Um, for instance, in the Middle East, 
and so forth. But we looked at it from the biblical point of view, um, and we have, you know, I see it as a dawn, meaning that as we dress, we must have proper order, and our portrayal must be to give honor unto God. It must be modest, meaning that it has to be properly arranged and, 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 and have, a, have good taste. And okay. there we're is following something you, there following you? that speaks about attention. Oh, your, your, your clothing um, should not, your lifestyle should draw attention unto others. But your clothing should not uh, draw negative attention in terms of how you, how you dress. Um, and that is what makes us unique um, in light of how we actually dress ourselves. You see that the God that we serve is a God of, 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 of order and not of confusion. Um, when we look at dress, right, it has to be one of order and not one of confusion. You know, sometimes you'll see certain um, persons walking the street and you're wondering, um, is it confusion? Even like these days, there's the, a the culture among the male in, how, in terms of how they dress themselves. The pants saggy and falling down and there's no order in that. Okay. And we are called to have order. Also, just, you know, last little point, um, in terms of, you know, we should not be, you know, altering God's creation. Dress um, in all its forms, right? Um, you'll hear more of it, but I'm saying that as you dress, take in mind that you have to be, you have to be simple. It has to be modest, not tight and short and revealing and all these things, and very appropriate um, for the occasion. So right. for now... Um, I just give you that in terms of our, our being unique in the line of dress. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Palmer. And um, Pastor Gittins, what do you have to say in the, in the, line, of, in the, in the line of food? Well, well, first of all, I must congratulate Pastor Palmer for pointing out so clearly how we are distinctive in terms of dress. Uh, in terms of food, uh, God outlined very clearly uh, since in Genesis chapter uh, 1, uh, the type of food we are supposed to eat, uh, which, which basically is fruits, grains, nuts, vegetable. However, uh, many individuals, in terms of eating meat, many individuals say you can eat anything, but as Seventh-day Adventists, we do not eat anything as far as creatures are concerned. Leviticus 11 points out for us clearly what is clean and what is unclean whether it is on land, whether it flies, or whether it's in the water, Leviticus 11 points out that. Uh, let me just quickly say uh, that Leviticus 11 points out that if uh, the hoof is parted for the animal and it chews the cud, uh, then it's good for us to consume. Okay. In the water, if it has scales and fins, uh, then it's good for us to consume. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, listeners should be aware of is that clean and unclean did not begin with the children of Israel uh, because when Noah was told to allow the animals to come into the ark, uh, they came in, the clean came in by seven and the unclean came in only two by two. So that, that predates the first Jew, which is Genesis chapter 12. So we must understand that God outlined, even before uh, they were Jews, that, listen, uh, there is clean and unclean uh, food. He outlined that. Uh, now, in terms, we as Seventh-day Adventists emphasize a lot uh, the vegetarian diet because that is the best diet. That is the best diet. Uh, now, in saying that, it doesn't mean that if a person is a vegetarian and they do whatever they feel like, they are bound for heaven. No. Uh, God created us, and uh, fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables, the vegetarian diet, that is the best diet, the healthy diet for mankind, right? Uh, so as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, that is how we stand in terms of clean and unclean food, right? Uh, Pastor Lambert, I don't know if... Well, let me just, let me just jump at it. Okay. Uh, the, our body is the temple of the living God. And our body being the temple of the living God, you cannot put any and everything into it because people purchase vehicles and they're very careful about what they put and where they put it. Sure. So this human body that God has given us, God is the one who says what is good to put into the temple. And in terms of what we drink, 
no alcohol. We, we still on food, eh? Uh, what we drink, no alcohol. Uh, what we smoke, well, we don't smoke at all. We should not because if God wanted us to smoke, he would have put a chimney on your head sure. so that the smoke can go out. Uh, so health in terms of what we eat is to preserve the body temple that God has given to us. Pastor Kittens, I want to ask a follow-up question. Tell um, me. So if you are vegetarian, it means that you can, once it's vegetarian food, you can eat as much as you like? Uh, <laughs> certainly no, uh, because here is where temperance comes in. Uh, so we have to understand very clearly uh, that something that is good, we must still be moderate in terms of how we consume it, right? Very important. That's a nice question, you know, because a lot of times people think that, oh, because water not good, I must drink any amount. No, 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 no. We have to be temperate in even that which is good. Yeah. All right, thank you. And this brings me to that scripture in, um, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31 that says, for whatsoever we eat and whatsoever we drink and whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory, glory of, God. of God. Right, so we got to be very careful in how we deport ourselves and discover dress and food that um, God will be glorified in whatever we do and how we conduct ourselves, right? Yeah. So over the years, there are many other things, not necessarily doctrines that are peculiar to us as Seventh-day Adventists. For example, street or uh, open-air evangelistic meetings, eight weeks, ten crusades, um, can you please comment on these relevance, this, this, um, the activities I have mentioned and the relevance of today? I want to say here that what is what was just mentioned, um, you know, like over the years, because bef before I become an um, Adventist, I always will, uh, will observe um, all of the ten crusades all the time, um, um, six weeks, eight weeks, Ten crusades. I always will observe that, and then a lot of openers used to be ha um, happening everywhere. The question is: Is it still relevant t um, today? Yes, it is still relevant today. It is still relevant. Um, the word of God still have to be proclaimed. These mediums, um, these ways of 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 of, of, of metal, um, remains the same. It remains in terms of proclaiming the word of God. How, um, however, as, as we progress towards Christ's coming, um, things will change. The message never, never changes. But like, as you mentioned, um, eight weeks. Today, very rare or probably not, you might have an eight-week crusade. You might get three, you might get four and five for the, for, for the, for, 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 for the most. This is happening in, um, because um, in um, people become in the life, it gets so busy that persons, you know, um, a lot of things um, gaining um, person, um, attention. And so you will want to um, have them um, captured to the hear the word of God. So you're, 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 you're not changing the gospel. You're not changing the, um, the message, but you're trying to see how you can reach them uh, um, um, so that they can hear the word of God. So, For instance, so these let me, days let me, there uh, are many. Let, let me interject. Mm -hmm. So what you are saying, you have the same item inside the package, but you're changing the packaging on the outside. Well, what I what I want to say is that to be a little more attractive. Not, excellent. You're not really diluting the message. For instance, there there, there is online because we are speaking about relevance. Mm -hmm. There there are online crusades there and so forth. There there are openers that are stream. And, and, and the message remains the same message, still powerful, but you're trying to tailor, for instance, length of time and all these things, making it more relevant um, to our present time. All right, thank you. Pastor Gittins, you want to share any insight? You know, probably had some experience with the eight weeks crusade because, um, and this is a really pertinent question because um, the recent mega fest that we had for three weeks, I invited some persons and then I told them, um, you're not coming, and they say, I'm coming just now, and I'm coming just now. And I say, watch, last week gone, and now we, we finished. <laughs> and they was like, oh, y'all finished quick, so I know y'all used to be up having a tent for a month and two months. And But time has changed. Uh, well, well, pass, uh, Pastor Lambert, you know, <clears throat> in the attention span of people, to me, has shortened. Uh, be that as it is, the church still remains the appointed agency for the salvation of men. 
And the purpose of the church is not just to, for, it's not for people to dress up and look nice. Mm -hmm. It's good to dress up and look nice, but that's not the purpose, purpose of the church. church. Yeah. The purpose of the church is that we have the message of salvation, and we need to proclaim it. So years ago, people had a lot of time, you know. Uh, they didn't even have TVs in the home. Uh, nowadays, everybody's walking around with a TV in the pocket. Uh, so for you to capture the attention of individuals uh, by running an eight-week crusade, that's a tough thing. So the messages need now to be presented, but in a shorter time. Uh, then, then too, let us, let us remember uh, that human beings uh, have this way nowadays of wanting to do several things. So if you run in at eight weeks, they are thinking about, well, what, what will I do during that eight weeks? Uh, so many things would be left back. So as Pastor Kimi said, yeah, the message has to go out. We package it differently, but it has to go out. But I do not, I would not advocate for eight weeks crusade now. Uh, for me, I think uh, the longest I went in terms of doing crusade is five weeks, right? Uh, not eight weeks. So, so the message must go out. Souls in need are dying uh, for the need of salvation. Uh, so we have to package it in a shorter time. That's, that's how I see it. All right. And um, in, the, in relation, well, um, Pastor Palmer mentioned um, open air services are being streamed. Um, what do you think should be our practice as it relates to open air service now? I know before there are some laws that the different government had made it relates to COVID and social gathering and so on. But now that things have settled or relaxed a little, what do you think should be our attitude towards the openness services? I think uh, I may be ancient, but I think we still need to go back to the actual open air. Let me tell you why. Open air and the tent meetings. Let me tell you why. Even though individuals like to sit in the comfort of the home and watch people preaching, etc., it is, it is easier for the evangelists and it's easy for, easier for those who are presenting uh, to help people to make decisions if you come face to face with them. Further, there are some individuals, uh, they feel bored also in the home and they like the social setting. They may not have come to listen to the word of God. Uh, they, they come with a sleeveless. Uh, they like the so social setting. And while they're and listening uh, and socializing, these individuals uh, can easier make decisions. You can help individuals to easier make decisions. Because you don't know when they're on a device, uh, if they look at you uh, for three minutes and then they switch you off. But when they are there, it's a captive audience and it's easier, the, the, the word here is decision. It's easier to me to help them to make decisions when you have a face-to-face -face audience. All right, thank you. Pastor Papa, you want to add something just to, to add that before um, we move on? Something to just to make sure that we actually get it. Um, we are just to reach, but not to dilute. If somebody missed it, we are just to reach, but not to dilute. Mm -hmm. And we're using what is relevant for, for our time. So um, when we had the, the time of the virus, we could not have gone out. Mm -hmm. So we used the means of online. Our country, in this part of the world, we have freedom of expression as, f as much as we can. We can go out, although we can you know, push it, and that's what we have now, and we have to use it. So it's still relevant. People are still being rich um, in their homes, and some people in the street, but we use what means we have. And as the time progresses and things change, we, we, we change, but still to reach someone for Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, thank you very much, Amen. and that's very important. You need you see, as the gospel also has to be, um, the gospel is up to date, but the method should also be up to date mm -hmm. because um, you, don't, you don't want to be presenting, for example, um, persons who used to use um, typewriter. Nowadays, you use computers. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't want to be a typewriter technician and you sit down in your, in your little um, workshop waiting for people to bring the typewriter machine to fix when, <laughs> indeed, and in fact, if there is any, it might just be an archive or something like that. Right? Or antique somewhere in some, somebody garage or some kind of thing. Right? It's the same way with the gospel. You have to bring it up to time, 
not as, as um, Pastor Palmer said, not to dilute the message, but we have to package it so we can meet individuals where they are. Even additionally, um, today there are a lot more competition than before for people's attention, mm -hmm. right? And, and for entertainment. So before, sometimes when nighttime reach, um, when we used to have eight, quick, eight weeks crusade and so, um, when night reach, people don't really know what else I'm doing for the night. So we have a tent with a whole set of people, crowd, pull crowd, everybody come. Mm -hmm. But now people could say, well, I watch some TikTok videos, I go on YouTube, I go on Facebook, I go on Netflix, I could do whatever I want. I could choose to come or not to come. Mm -hmm. Right? So as a result of that, we have to try to meet them even sometime right on the device that um, the device that they are using. All right? Mm -hmm. So we're moving on. Pastor, as a third generation Adventist, what are some of the things that are remained unchanged? And what are some of the evolving issues relating to our church? Just to look at our text. Because we have to continually bring, bring the point. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, just the first part. For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Some texts say, I change not. Therefore you are not consumer sons of, of Jacob. But the first part says, Malachi 3 and verse 6, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. So um, there are things that remain unchanged, that will not change. For instance, that's speaking about God and his principles. You see, principles never change. Rules have changed. Right now, we have the World Cup on. Make up of rules. And rules are always changing in the, in the game. But where God was concerned, the principles never change. So, for instance, what remains unchanged to us as a church, as a church, is the way we, we worship God. The Sabbath day. The seventh day remains unchanged. That cannot change. That's a principle um, from since creation. That cannot change. How we worship our creator and what he told um, in, um, give us um, from his word to do on the seventh day. Um, further, further, the aspect about, about marriage is unchanging. That does not change. That cannot change. That is a principle of God and, 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 other, and other church. Um, thank God we are maintaining that. Um, one man, one woman, male and female in holy matrimony. And that does not change. We know that these days the, there's a culture, you will hear more and more of it. There's a culture of the LGBT stuff um, in terms of, of, of changes um, on their side. But uh, the church remains um, um, firm on that ground. So we have worship, we have health. The health message as was um, expressed earlier in terms of our food and our diet. Um, clean remains clean, unclean remains unclean. Um, good health, um, rest and water and air and all these things, that does not change. We always promote that um, to our members, to, our, to, to people on the street, to the world. That message of the health message does not change. It's unchanging. Um, our youth ministry work, our missionary work, um, as, a, as a conference, um, at times it happened here in the past that we send away persons to Suriname, to Guyana. As missionaries, yeah. As missionaries to go and work and that, the gospel never changed. Um, for in the, in, in, on the bigger scene, America and Africa and Asia, India, persons will travel and, and, and they will spread the word of God. They will build churches and, and all these things. That does not change. So, but they are also um, um, evolving um, issues um, which, 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 as I say, evolving. As the question said, evolving. Women ministry, um, 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 musical instruments in church, in church dress has, been, has become a challenge in terms of hairstyle with, male, with, the, with the men. And, and for, let me just go back a bit on musical instrument. It's evolving. Um, in, in years gone by, when the, when the church was in its formative state here, that the pan, the instrument of the steel, of the steel pan, was a no no in church. That was a no no, but it, but um, now we are seeing that um, it is acceptable um, in terms of the steel pan and the drums. So there are some things remain unchanging and some things are, are evolving. But whatever um, has been done, change or evolving, has to be in line with the word of God. Thank you. Pastor Gittins, you want to add to what um, Pastor Palmer has stated? Well, well the, the truth from God's word as presented by the church can't change as Pastor Palmer rightly and ably put it over. God says, I'm the Lord thy God, I change not. 
So we as Seventh-day Adventists, we represent God's church. So since we represent and portray God's church, you don't expect these principles that the church is True. built on uh, to change. Uh, commandment, that can't change. Sabbath cannot change. Second coming of Christ, that cannot change. All right? Hope in the resurrection, that cannot change. These uh, uh, doctrines, principles outlined in God's word cannot change. Uh, what, he, what Pastor Palmer rightly said is that they are evolving issues. Take, for instance, ordination of women. Or you don't have to go there. Uh, uh, women uh, working as pastors, right? right. Uh, because uh, when I began as a pastor, I'm, I'm stretching my mind to remember if in the Caribbean there was any female pastor, and I'm not coming up with any, right? Uh, so, so this now is not a wrong or right issue. Uh, this is a, something that is evolving based on the need. Uh, so we must be able to separate what is wrong or right or what is sin and what is not sin what as it evolving? relates to the church uh, mm -hmm. from uh, things that change based on what the times called for or based on the needs within the church. And so, so once we get that right, uh, we wouldn't be arguing as to whether a woman can pastor or not. Uh, we wouldn't be arguing over that because there's need for, there always was and always will be need for both sexes in ministry. So we must make this differentiation. Or like Pastor Palmer also rightfully pointed out that, listen, God outlined marriage is between a male and a female, man and woman. So the LGBT Q, etc. movement that is trying to erode that definition, that will not change as far as the church is concerned because God's word outlined uh, who are the people who are legitimately married. God's word outlined that. All right, we just see one of our um, viewers asking, said, I'm happy that you stated that the church does not change, but how do we deal with the changes in the church culture, such as the hairstyle we see our young men having these days? Uh, well, Paz, if you ask me that question, uh, you just dig up something controversial that somebody is going to be annoyed with. <laughs> so let me answer it in a personal way, okay. right? Uh, don't blame me for that. Uh, if a young man comes into the church and his hair is not smelly and he combs it neatly, I don't see a problem in that. I don't see a problem in that because, you see, who, now, we're dealing here with something that is not about wrong or right. It's something about what is culturally acceptable. Uh, so, so, so listen to this. If a young man has a Rastafarian lifestyle and his hairstyle, his locks, show that. I have a problem with that because now this young man, uh, he now aligns, has aligned himself with the Rastafarian movement, which is seen as another religion. Okay. I hope we get the difference yeah, there. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, because uh, basically, what is going to happen, we're we dealing with culture now, the people who came from an era before, they would be annoyed and say, his hair must be short, right? And it must cut, right? His hair must be short and it must cut short. But culturally, these things are changing. So I need to accept and go along with that. Notice my differentiation. Yeah, I, I am not here saying that, hey, you have a Rastafarian hairstyle and you're Rastafarian, uh, which is like another religion. Hey, we must allow that. That's not what I'm saying. Right? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right. So we're moving on to, um, we have some, some very interesting um, questions and some Interesting responses. Um, today we are dealing with the sec part two of Seventh-day Adventists and its identity. All right, Seventh-day Adventists and its identity. All right, and we just dealt with some very interesting um, areas. We talk about what has, what has been unchanged and some of the things that have been involving. Um, Pastor, someone who joined the church in more recent times, have you seen significant changes? Please explain. Um. Let me, let me just say that as the senior person on the panel this morning, it may be good for me to jump at that one. Mm. 
Uh, let me explain. Growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I see a lot of difference. I see a lot of difference. Take, for instance, while I was growing up as a child, we had to memorize God's word. Uh, you, had to, you, you had to do a lot of memory work as far as God's word is some concerned. Some people memorize entire chapters. Uh, now, nowadays, with the coming of devices, I notice that uh, this generation, they don't see the need to memorize. Why memorize when I can, at the flick of a button, get the text? Now, now, how does that impact on my lifestyle? Let me say, the Bible points out, uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You see, when I memorize God's word, it becomes a part of me. So it becoming a part of me, when I am about to sin or tempted to sin, the word jumps out and kicks me. This, this is serious stuff. Uh, so so I, I see a difference there. I see a difference there in that, just, I'm, I'm just on that, the, the memorizing and knowing and being acquainted with God's word helped me in that time to be cautious of temptation. Now, now another thing, uh, when, when, I, when I preach nowadays, I'm very careful, if I'm preaching about David and Goliath, I'm very careful about dealing with the story before making application from it. Because a lot of people in the audience, they have not read that story. Right? So, so, so the thing is, what I'm saying is, the saturation of God's word, uh, the story, the memorizing, right, is important. And that change is causing us uh, to lose track of how God wants us to live. Right? Uh, so, so, but, 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 but now I'm talking from the other side of my mouth. With the coming of devices also, uh, that change helps also because the devices can be used in a positive way, let's say in the morning, to help me with morning worship, to help me with my lesson study, to help me going down a spiritual path. Uh, the, the devices can also cause me uh, to delve into listening uh, to E.G. White, uh, the prophetess of the church, and what she says. Long ago, I had to go to a library and get these books. But nowadays, right online, I can listen to E.G. White audio books and, and, and check what she says. So I, I'm, it, it may sound as if I'm talking from two sides of my mouth. But purposely, uh, there is a lot of positive also in terms of the devices. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. So we will, at this point in time, we'll have our special music. We'll have a special music um, that will uplift and glorify God. And after that, we will continue our discussion with the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its identity, part two. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear.
Right, we want to thank Eden Spirits for this wonderful special music that give God all the glory that he deserves. You know, there is none like him. He always deserves all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. All right, for those of you who might be just joining us, we are in part two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its identity. Last week was part one. So this week we are, we are concluding, and we, are, we just had a a special transmission, breaking transmission, and that was to give God thanks and praise through the special music. But we continue our discussion. I have with me Pastor Palmer to my extreme right and Pastor Gittens to my immediate right. So we continue to discuss such an interesting topic. So as we discussed last, as was discussed last week, the Seventh Day Adventist Church was established on the premise of preaching the everlasting gospel. How do we see the church continue to fulfill that role in light of the difficulties that we face in the world today? It is undoubtedly, and we can say it, that we are in interesting times, challenging times, they might want to use the word difficult times, to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Um, challenging in light of, as was discussed earlier, persons um, in time past, you'll put a tent and persons will walk in the tent mm -hmm. freely. They come, you don't have to force anybody, they walk in the tent. That's because that, that has become challenging uh, because of um, other, um, not really attraction, but it could be distraction on their part. So we are in challenging times, and as mentioned, um, in terms of changes to the church, one of the big the, the, I mean, the biggest one that we're experiencing um, well, a, is a positive change. The use of the social media, um, God using anything to proclaim the word, but we've seen that happening there. So we are in, 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 in difficult times worldwide. We just passed through a, a series of events, and it's not over. There are other things coming. So um, 
However, the question is how, how can you know how can we see the church continue to fulfill its role? The church has to continue to, ful to fulfill the role that God has given it, which is to proclaim the good news of salvation prophetically and on all aspects. Let me give you a text out there um, just to back up that the church has to continue to do what, is ha what it has to do. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, it says here to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, um, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So even if that we are in difficult, challenging times, the church have to preach the word in good times, in challenging times, in whatever times. We have to preach the word because that is our mandate. Also, um, as, um, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel have it. Isaiah have it. I want to read for you from Isaiah chapter, um, Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 6. It says here, yeah, I have set watchmen upon the walls, O, o Jerusalem, which shall never hold a peace day or night. He that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. So even if that we are in, in challenging times, we cannot keep silent. Um, so we have to use the different aspect of, 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 of the gospel or what we have um, just to go back on what was mentioned, online programs. Um, right here now is a testimony of in, in, in how we can use different things to proclaim God's word even in tough times. When the virus hit, um, thank God that we were already online. So we begin to um, um, bring programs online one time and this continues even up to, up to now. So we have to use other aspects. Um, okay, we mentioned missionary work. Um, Times time might be challenging, but persons out there can still be encouraged um, to go. You could be within your village, within your homes, um, abroad and do missionary work. Paul, um, who was um, one of the early ones in terms of um, establishing churches. Um, he went on a lot of different m m um, journeys, as we call it, missionary journeys. He went out there. So um, even times of, are tight and, and, and hard and difficult to fulfill the role of the gospel. You use what you have, whether it's online, um, whether it's street openers, um, whether it's missionary work. Um, of course, the health message. Is very when I just just you know give me a couple seconds when I just joined the joined the church, there were no other organization that proclaimed the health message mm -hmm. and health fairs that used to happen way back when, but to see it um now it uh, it has become um something very important and all way you go we having health fairs other persons have joined into and doing health fairs so we are bringing the message. In difficult times, using all these health um, events so persons can know about the health and at the same time know how to take care of the body of God. All right, thank you very much. Pastor Gittin, do you want to add some, some information? Uh, to well, the well um, Pastor, um, Pastor Palmer said a lot. I, I agree a form. Uh, let me just add that friendship, it may sound like a strange point. But friendship with those in our community is very important in terms of us carrying the gospel in whatever way. Uh, because if, you, if you're doing it as far as, say, online, uh, you gotta, you got to be the friend of that individual to really get that person to check that program online. And being the friend of that individual... Uh, you can later on come and get a feedback from the person as to whether or not they did listen. So, yeah, because he's your friend. So, so in this modern day and age, we have to be careful that we befriend those individuals within which community we dwell. Because by doing that, whether it's inviting them face to face or online, and getting them to really listen to God's word. The friendship within evangelism helps a lot. The other thing is, uh, it is good for us now uh, to, 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 to focus a lot in terms of reaping, reaping evangelistic programs, which goes nicely 
if we have been studying with whoever so that when the event comes around, be it online or be it face-to-face -face under a tent, right? Uh, you have been studying with this person because you are the friend of this individual. It's easier now to get that individual to make decision. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Um, additionally, um, an extension to the question that I've just asked, two of these things we are known for, our schools, our university, and hospitals. How can we spread the gospel utilizing these means? And do you have any testimony of persons who came in contact with Jesus via these means? Uh, well, well, Pass, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a lot of schools, universities, etc., uh, I was trying to get, uh, in, in terms of total number of schools, uh, we have uh, worldwide, among the 21 million Seventh-day Adventists, we have uh, 9,419 in terms of total number. Tertiary institutions, 118. Uh, worker training institutions, 38. Secondary schools, uh, 2,640. Uh, primary schools, 6,623. I'm just, I'm just giving that stat for us to understand how schools can impact in terms of uh, total enrollment, uh, in terms of these schools, it's over 2 million individuals. Now, now, why I give that stat? I give that stat to let us know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a giant organization. Uh, it's also claimed to be one of the largest growing organizations. Uh, that, that stat came out also. Now, if you have, uh, having, not if you have, having this number of, of, of learning institutions, listen, uh, you can't help but impact in the lives of individuals. Uh, take, for instance, uh, I went to CUC, not USC, CUC then, somewhere between 84 to 88, somewhere around that time. And I remember distinctly persons who went to teacher's training college together with me. I'm remembering one right now and some others who, did, who, who came to CUC not as baptized members, but very soon because of the program of the church uh, that impact them, they changed their lives and became believers, Seventh-day Adventists. So definitely learning institutions because of the daily program where we focus on God, uh, where we focus on religion, uh, where we focus on uh, keeping God's Ten Commandments, where we focus on the body temple of God, uh, where we have this holistic lifestyle, what we eat, etc. That does impact the lives of individuals. And before long, these people definitely embrace Christ and Christianity. All right, thank you very much. All right, and um, we're moving on. I'm sure that you have heard or read that Seventh-day Adventist is referred to as a cult. Can you please explain why we are not a cult? Well, <laughs> pass. So first thing I would like to know, what is a cult? Mm -hmm. Pastor Gittins? Well, well, let me, let me, let mm -hmm. me pass. Mm -hmm. Let me what, just what? stick in the sure. definition mm -hmm. and sure. then I'll go back to you. Uh, in modern English, a cult uh, is usually a derogatory or pejorative term for social, a social group that is defined as an unusual religious, spiritual, or has unusual religious or spiritual uh, as well as philosophical beliefs and rituals. Uh, it, so, so, so basically, people laugh at and downgrade and cast aspersions and derogatory remarks at individuals who they see as cults, right? Uh, see as cults. Uh, let me just defend. Uh, a cult is also seen as a group of individuals. I'm just using layman term. Individuals who come together is seen as a small group and they focus more on the worship of an individual, not necessarily God, right? Uh, it's like hero worship of this individual. Uh, so it's like a cradle movement. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church cannot be seen as a cult because of the gigantic nature of our organization. And like many other religious groups, we serve and worship God. 
right? We Definitely. serve and worship God, right? All right. All right. So, 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 so we, we cannot be seen as a cult. And the Bible is used, uh, not, not a secret book. The Bible is used as the rule book for us as Seventh-day Adventists. No secret book. The Bible is used as that. Uh, All right, thank you. Pastor Palmer? Well, that's something that when I, when I joined the church, that I, I was told that I am entering into a cult organization. But before I joined, I, I observed them back then. <laughs> and there was nothing there. That was years back. That, that, that would tell me I'm in a cult environment. Well, I want to say my song kind of controversial. Mm -hmm. But if it's cultic, <laughs> I'm in a good place. <laughs> <laughs> um, meaning that, that our leader is not a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. Our leader is Christ. Yes. And, and, and we, we follow the Bible that, that, that tells us that, we, that the, um, our mind has to be in Christ. When you look at um, cultic groups, that the, there is a, a leader that they worship as a god. They have they, they, they cut off the idea that there's no outside family. That I'm not seeing that here in this church. We love, we have, of course, we are a body of believers, but we love everybody, even outside of the church, because we want to bring them in the church. So we love everybody, and we're not having this outside, inside stuff. Um, a cult, they are very zealous, and they cannot question them. We've been here, we're getting questions I can ask. When I just joined the, the church, there's something called um, Sabbath school or lesson study. Mm -hmm. I could have gone there. I could have sit down. I could have just asked questions. I wasn't no member of the church, and I, I got answers. But in a quality group that you cannot question them, there's no question asked. You, you obey and you follow the rule. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to control the mind. Mm -hmm. We, um, does always say, let his mind be in you, which is Christ. Christ is the one to control our, our mind. So, I am, and we can take a whole day and give you all evidence that we are not following a cultural group. People just use these things to discredit this wonderful movement mm. um, ordained by God and to proclaim the gospel um, message. We are, we are speaking and we are carrying the word of God. So, really and, 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 and truly, that the looking at are these things we are not no cult we are proclaiming the word of god there is no one um we sit above the above god or above the bible there is no book except the bible is the bible and the bible mm -hmm. alone a god and god alone christ died for us and no man and so we are following that line i cannot say i belong to a cult thank you very I much i am Pastor. following the word of god all right thank you all right um so as we come down to the end um, there are some things that have changed in the passage of time, naturally, and there are some things we should change. Can you please explain why the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church have not changed over the years? When we, when we mention um, changes that, and doctrine that never change, doctrine speaks about um, our teaching, our instructions, you know, um, principles. And I mentioned earlier, principles never change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rules has changed. Um, there's a, a word that shows up in the Bible, tradition. Mm -hmm. That does change. Our doctrine is based on some biblical principle, grounded on the word of God, that does not change. We have something that we call the 28 fundamental beliefs. And even if we call it um, our 28 fundamental beliefs, that is hinged entirely on the word of God. All there, right. there is text to back up every sentence. There is information from the Bible that shows that, yes, that's, that's a belief, but it is found in the Bible and not contrary. So we're using the Bible as the groundwork, as the basis of our doctrine. And, 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 our, and already our doctrine is what the word of God has said unto us. So um, 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 the doctrine of the church will never change any time. Anytime there is any moment of change, um, it will be revealed by the, by, the, by the Holy Spirit. Probably some person trying to have their own influence, as, or probably, as we just say, to be accord. <laughs> but I'm saying that that will not happen. God is in, in control of this church, and whatever doctrine we have cannot change. Because um, um, when I go and visit 
um, persons. Prayer is important. We pray for them. And we've seen, we, we've seen healing. That doesn't change. And we believe in the power of prayer. And that's a serious belief that we believe in. And we're not praying to man or to ourselves. We are praying to Christ who can bring healing unto our souls. All right, thank you. Pastor Gittins, what do you have to say about that? Well, the, I hold in my hand the baptismal certificate mm -hmm. uh, that we give to individuals when they are baptized. And what is outlined in here, Pastor Palmer spoke about the 28 fundamental beliefs. And also at the back, we have the commitment, the vows. Now, what is outlined in here comes from the word of God. And God's True. word doesn't change. The grass withereth, it. The flower fade. But the word of the Lord endures forever. What is in this baptismal vow? What is there? Uh, well, a lot of things, but it comes directly from the word of God. Your mm -hmm. body being the temple of God. Uh, Sabbath, uh, keeping God's law, uh, a returning of tithe. All of that is biblical. It's biblical. Our lifestyle, uh, don't commit adultery, the sexual purity, all of that is outlined, what we should eat. It comes from the word of God. Uh, so the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs, uh, the doctrines, they wouldn't change. Why? Because over thousands of years, God has not changed his word. And so since our beliefs, uh, belief structure, our commitment in the vows uh, come from the word of God, it wouldn't change wouldn't change. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. At this point in time, you have the opportunity to give your closing remarks. Uh, remember we, our topic that we discussed was the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its identity. So you can now give some closing remarks as we get ready to conclude. Well, I want to say here that um, speaking about the church and the doctrine that is, you know, un not changing, unchanging. When I joined the church, you know, I was told that the, I, I was given a timeline and all these things, you know, but I'm still here. Praise Years God. after, I'm still here. Because the foundation is not based on man. It's Amen. based on God. And Amen. I'm following the Bible. And the Bible alone, I'm following other inspired writings to help, you know, to, to make things clearer. But the Bible is the basis for it. And I'm following Christ. So, so, so I'm saying that things, some things will, will change. It's, it's, it's natural. We are in a world that Christ is, com is coming back. But something will change. It's not it's natural. But I, I, I will say it again, so you must, don't miss it. But God's principles, which we follow in, will never change. And thank God, I'm a part of this great remnant church that never changes. And so, um, by God's by God grace, what will change will change. But thank God, God will never change, and I'm following God. Amen? Amen. Thank you Praise very much. Pastor Gittens? Uh, well, unlike Pastor Palmer, I'm a fourth-generation Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, I'm not saying that to sound proud. It's just a matter of fact. I'm a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. Parents were grandparents, great-grandparents. Now, having said that, I am grateful to God to have belonged since a baby in the womb to the Seventh-day Adventist Church because it, it, it helps you to live a safe lifestyle. It helps you to remember to be accountable to God. It helps me uh, to make sure that I see human life as very valuable. And it helps me in terms of my family life to structure my family life based on the word of God as outlined within the Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist doctrine. And finally, as a Seventh-day Adventist, right, in keeping with our topic, I sense that Jesus Christ is coming soon and I need always to present and to preach God's word to help others to be ready for the second coming of Christ. All right, thank you very much. I thank all the viewers, those who took the time to view. Um, you can still share the link so somebody can view tonight as we have a rebroadcast at 8 p.m. Um, tonight. So let us pray. Father and God, we give you thanks and praise for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for being with us today. We pray, dear God, for areas that we are lacking, that you give us the strength so we'll be able to improve, dear God, and properly represent you and your church. We give you thanks and praise for your love and your mercy. If there was anyone who, were not, who is not an Adventist and they were listening, dear God, they're not part of your remnant, I pray, dear God, that what have been presented 
has inspired them, dear God, so they have the desire to come to know you, whom to know is life eternal. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, and enjoy the rest of the day.